Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Sikli Denik, uh, founder of the Cantonese Alliance, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Gina Tan of Trinity University uh, tonight. Uh, Dr. Tan is widely considered a top young scholar in December, I mean, a top young China scholar. In December 2021, she was selected as one of the 20 prominent China specialists through the National Committee on China-U.S. Relations. Her book, which is in the background, Dialect and Nationalism in China, 1860 to 1960, has been praised for her thoroughness, insightfulness, fresh perspectives, and her courage to take on a very sensitive topic. So it doesn't come as a surprise that a senior China scholar calls her book the definitive text on the subject. Now, on a more personal note, I met Dr. Tan over 10 years ago in one of my Cantonese classes at Stanford University, where she was pursuing her doctoral degree in history. Prior to joining Stanford, she actually has spent a year studying at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She has since visited the city frequently and is very familiar with the current status of the Cantonese language in the city and elsewhere. And so it is really our great honor tonight to have her speak to us about one of the most frequently asked questions about the Cantonese language. Is it a dialect? or is it the language? So here's Dr. Tom. Um, thank you so much for that extremely generous introduction. Um, so I, I, I want to give just a really brief introduction to a question that I think Zeng Lucy said is, is really sensitive. And, and the reason I think it's sensitive is both historical and political. Um, and so what I what I, I want to do is, is introduce a little bit why this is so political um, and why this matters. And then the history of sort of how we got here, because I think by understanding that history, um, we can understand a lot more about where we are in the present. Um, so I'm going to start with a really simple question, which we were already chatting about, <laughs> um, which um, but um, I'll sort of address it for, for everyone who wasn't here in the beginning opening. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So this seems, in some ways, I think people think this is a pretty simple question, perhaps not everyone in the audience here, but I think for a general audience, this is a pretty simple question. Um, if I were to ask sort of your average person in the United States or in the PRC, um, and this question of sort of what is the Chinese language, they would probably answer with the language what we in English call Mandarin, um, or in Mandarin would be called Wutonghua uh, or Guo Yu, depending on where you are, right? There's lots of terms for this language, right? Um, it is the language that is taught in schools throughout the PRC and Taiwan. Um, it is also the language that represents China abroad. We were, we were chatting about this briefly also in the opening. Um, it is constitutive of one of the official languages of the United Nations, which is defined only as Chinese. Um, and it is the language that almost entirely, in large part, not entirely because of this group, which is wonderful, um, Chinese language education around the world. Um, at my university in Texas, uh, if one were to major in Chinese, it would usually mean Mandarin. Um, again, I know this group is, is, is a really important source for making sure that that is not universally true, um, but is sub substantively true, right? Um, yep. As we also know in this group, Mandarin is by no means the only language that can be called Chinese. We'll leave aside the script for now that we can talk about that a little bit in Q&A if we'd like, um, because that has a really complex history. It can also refer to a large number of oral languages that are mutually unintelligible with Mandarin. It can refer to ancient or archaic Chinese, which are recreations of languages likely spoken hundreds or thousands of years ago in the place that we today call China. It can also refer to an enormous number of local languages spoken throughout the Chinese speaking world, right? Um, Mandarin, archaic Chinese, including many, many shown on this map, um, as well as, of course, Cantonese, which has millions of speakers, um, tens of millions of speakers abroad. Now, the government of the People's Republic of China official, officially recognizes these languages from the widely spoken ones like Cantonese um, to smaller variants as Fangyan. Oh, there we go. Um, a term or phoneme, right? A term we would most frequently translate into English as the word dialect. 
Um, that's actually the, the, the translation on the cover of my book after much consternation and back and forth with my publishers. That's what we ended up with. Um, but this translation is inherently problematic. Um, when we think about dialects, we often think about them being subordinate. Calling something a dialect only makes sense if it is a dialect of something. Moreover, linguists will stress that dialects are mutually intelligible with the language they are a dialect of and one another. Such criteria do not apply to all or even most languages, tongues, whatever you want to call them, what, what in the category of like feng yin, right? Cantonese is not mutually intelligible with Mandarin or Shanghainese, um, nor is Qingdaoese mutually intelligible with Hakka. And though the Chinese government calls Mandarin a language, feng yin do not historically derive from the language that today we call Mandarin. Yet despite this really misleading translation, um, discourse from the PRC government and in popular forums, I don't want to just make this a state-driven thing, right, um, not only insist that these Chinese languages, feng yin, right, ought to be translated as the word English word dialect, it also presumes that they should be treated as though they have all of the same connotations as the word dialect. So educational materials call feng yim variants, oh, I'm going to stick right here, variants or branches of the Chinese language. Uh, high profile government figures are often found directly refuting the suggestion that feng yim like Cantonese could be considered independent languages or mother tongues. Mandarin, on the other hand, in the PRC is um, in the constitution is called the common language of the Han people and the Chinese nation, without which society can neither be preserved, develop or progress. In this particular picture here from a Shanghai elementary school, we see a child holding a sign that says promulgate Mandarin and together build the China dream. Um, so if dialect is a pretty misleading translation of feng yin, why is there this widespread insistence both within the PRC and outside of it that 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 they that this term ought to be translated as dialect and more importantly that that all of these different languages or dialects and and everything in between ought to be treated as subsidiary as less important or even as conflatable with mandarin right like one of the things you'll often hear is well we don't need to teach cantonese because we already teach mandarin Right. And more importantly, why does this matter on a global scale at all? So what I want to do in my, my sort of brief time today is talk a little bit about how this happened, why this happened and why it matters in, in 15 minutes or so. Um, more specifically, I'm going to talk about how the presumption that languages like Cantonese are nothing more than dialects resulted over battles over um, uh, competing understandings of the Chinese nation that began in the early 20th century. Aha, there we go. Um, and um, because I cannot exhaustively talk about this in this short talk, and because I want to give plenty of time for Q&A, I thought I would focus on one particular event, the construction of the Chinese national language, um, focusing on how battles over what that should be solidified a shift in how uh, feng yim as a category were imagined, a shift from thinking about them as local languages that were not subordinate to dialects that were imagined as subsidiary to the national standard. Um, I'll then wrap up by talking a little bit about the contemporary implications of that today. Okay, now uh, we were, again, we were talking about this in the introduction. This is a story that my guess many people in the audience have heard quite frequently. Um, in, in the context of my research, this is the story that in particular, when I spent a lot of time in, in Guangzhou and Hong Kong, people loved to tell me this story, right? So the story often goes something like this. Um, in the early 20th century, the Republic of China had just been founded and was struggling to get its bearings. The Republic had replaced a 300-year-old dynasty, which had slowly crumbled in the face of domestic turmoil and multiple, de multiple defeats in foreign wars. As revolutionaries turned state builders struggled to make a Chinese nation from dream to reality, they hotly debated what actually made a nation powerful, and they decided that a unified national language was really important in signaling um, um, in signaling the country's strength and sovereignty. Um, there was this conference to choose the national language. People came from all over China, um, and then people voted, and Beijing barely won to serve as the nation's linguistic representative. Um, the reason this comes up a lot is that Cantonese speakers really, really love to say that they, and and I would like to point out that it's overwhelmingly as Cantonese speakers that like to say we lost by two votes or three votes or four votes, the number of votes tends to change. Um, I've heard this from speakers of other languages too. Um, overwhelmingly though, this is, this is a popular Cantonese story, right? Um, so like any good historical story, this one's a mix of historical events laced with strategic myth making. Um, 
so I'm I'm really I don't want to be the person to tell you all that that like this is this is untrue. The fact is I don't know if it's true. Um, I am going to talk pretty extensively about a conference where they determine a national standard, um, and that is not exactly what happened. Right, Cantonese didn't lose, so to speak. Um, there were other conferences. People may not have written it down. I don't know. Um, I may not have never found this trove of documents about it. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, I don't have good evidence that there was a vote between like Beijing pronunciation and Cantonese pronunciation. Okay. Um, another part is so because it's often this 1913 conference that often comes to people's mind. Um, I, I think one of the other sort of things that's that's interesting about this is that um when the the result of that conference was actually not the mandarin that we speak today um it is or that some of us speak today right it is it was actually a different national language that they that they landed on at the end of this conference that they would then abandon about a decade and a half later um but what I actually find most misleading about this particular story that it was this sort of like whose fung who's fung yin do we choose, right? Is that I it it makes it seem like this was a contentious process because everyone just wanted their own language to be the national language. And that the operative question was always which region's language gets to win. And that because we were simply picking one language to serve as the national language, we were already creating a hierarchy, right? That creates a hierarchy. There's one winner and a bunch of losers, right? But if we look at how they're thinking about this in the early 20th century and how China's first national language was founded, we find that that's not how they were thinking about this process, right? Really, the operative question for them was much less which existing Fang Yim language do we choose to be the standard and much more what does it mean for a language to represent a nation? Um, and there were a few men who articulated this thinking better than this man, um, Zhang Bingli, he's also called Zhang Taiyan. Um, he's, he's difficult for scholars to study um, because his work is often full of contradictions, uh, but one consistent position for, with, for which he became quite well known was the idea that China's new nation had to be of and for ethnic Han Chinese people. In particular, he uh, very strongly was against the political power held by the Manchurian ruler class of China's Qing dynasty. Now, while he argued this in a number of venues, using a lot of variety of evidence to support his contention, there was one work that indirectly tied this argument to language, and it was called, um, it, would, it could either be uh, Sang Feng Yim or, or New Dialect or New Feng Yim, however you want to translate this, right? Um, and this was published over um, a few years as a series of articles. By the way, my cat might just sort of go back and forth. So um, he likes he likes being on Zoom. Um, <laughs> um, and um, over the course of a few years, this was this publishes a series of articles. And the idea was to trace for the origins of of Chinese of the Chinese language um, by tracing the etymology of several hundred regional phrases back to texts from a couple of thousand years ago. Um, but as he makes clear in his introduction, and other contributors argue even more clearly in sort of like forwards and afterwards of this of this published book, um, that Zhang's work rested on the presumption that all Chinese languages, um, in particular, we're talking about like Han Yu Fang Yan, right? Like, like um, Chinese, like, like Chinese being Han Yu here, right? Um, Fang Yu from there, um, that they all emanated from one shared language and that they were evidenced of an idealized antiquity that began with the civilizational origins of the Han people. Um, sorry. Again, Kat really likes being on Zoom. Um, relatedly, he sought to prove that his contention, um, prove a contention that while all Fang Yim had a shared connection to this core, some preserved it better than others and therefore had a closer connection to the lineage of the Han people. Now, he doesn't explicitly state this in, in New Dialect here, um, but it seems clear that um, if informed Zhang's prescription for a Chinese national language. He believed that it should be a constructed language that embodied sort of the shared historical core um, that all um, Han Yu languages share, right? Han Yu, yeah, Han Yu Feng Yim shared, right? Um, such a construction, of course, would need a base language upon which it would be built. Um, and guided by his anti-Manchu politics, he was very, very strongly opposed um, to Beijing Fang Yin because he argued that Northern Fang Yin were not purely Chinese anymore. Um, for some people, this is also a common story or um, um, thing that likes to be told about Cantonese, right, is that, that Northern languages are sort of less Chinese. Um, and Zhang believed that very strongly. <laughs> um, and in fact, there's... Um, 
it's this is a, this is a really widespread narrative in the early 20th century um but a lot of people who like to say it in the early 20th century often quote him right like um um they they find him a kind of authority on this that 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 lives with their contention that northern languages are sort of less chinese okay um and um and um yeah um, so instead, he suggested that the Chinese national language be based loosely off of the language spoken in the center of China. He called it the, the, the language of the states of Chu and Han, which gets into his sort of ideas about antiquity. Um, all right, buddy, I got to get down. Um, that we don't have to get into here, but um, it, it's it's related to his ideas about antiquity. Now, after the 1911 revolution, um, proposals like Zhang seemed quite attuned to the needs of the new nation, as many saw the capital as too closely tied to the fallen Qing dynasty. A lot of our revolutionaries are from the South um, and therefore really had, had similar kinds of vitriol um, towards not just the Manchus, but also just sort of Northern people in general, right? Um, and his ideas attracted prominent supporters, including many members of that conference convened in 1913 to determine the pronunciation of the Chinese national language. Um, this isn't actually that I couldn't find a picture of that actual conference. This is a different conference, right? Um, but you have about like 80 people coming together to try and decide what the national language should be. And they don't really vote what they do. Again, this is to the best of our knowledge, we don't have a ton of documentation here, right? But to the best of our knowledge, um, what they do is they tr they all sort of write down how they think a list of characters should be pronounced. Now, there is a camp at this conference that thinks that because Japan and France and other countries tend to choose the language of their capital, um, that China should do the same. Um, and that at this point, the capital is Beijing, right? And so therefore they should just choose Beijing's language. But then you also have sort of this Southern camp and they're not necessarily saying, a lot of them are from like Jiangsu. They're from different areas around China. Um, and they're not so much saying like, it should be like Jiangsu Hua or should be Cantonese or these kinds of things. They're more saying that like Cantonese or Southern Fengyin, Southern languages have particular characteristics that are lost in Northern languages. And therefore our new language should really reflect that. Right? It should look more like a Southern language than like a Northern language, okay? Um, so they have this really contentious meeting, and what they end up with is a language that is about 80 to 90 percent similar to the phonology of Beijing, but it's still a constructed language with the remaining 10 to 20 percent of its phonology comprised of characteristics taken from other Fengyim, including in particular, um, as I'm sure a lot of people here who are Cantonese speakers know that Cantonese has stop endings, right? Like the K's and the T's at the end of words. Um, that is particular to a lot of, not all Southern Fengyim, but a lot of them. Um, and that, that gets included into this new language, those distinctions. Now, why did they do this? The key reason is that for many of these first constructions of the Chinese language, they did not believe that one particular Chinese language had the ability to represent the nation in its entirety. They, they, they've rejected this idea that picking one would be okay. Right. They, they understood that this was a, a process of creating one winner and many losers, and they didn't think that that was a good way to represent the nation. OK, um, but this um, but and so, again, there were some who wanted to do that, but they but those were sort of like met with fierce opposition. Um, and so, in other words, in sort of creating this national language, the majority of the men here, and as far as I know, they were all men um, that um, they believe that a language that at once represented the nation's present while also embodying its shared past had to be something that they created. And in this vision, Fongim, right, were not branches or subsidiary versions of, of, of this ideal Chineseness. They were rather different pieces of a puzzle without which the full picture of the nation would be woefully incomplete. And so in 1913, we have our first Chinese national language, a new invention for a new nation. Sorry, we'll get there in a second. But after a few years, this national language, seemingly born of this idealism, managed to make a lot of people frustrated, right? Um, for those who had the, to do the work of teaching it, of promulgating it, of making it a national language, um, saw its shortcomings, casting doubt on the feasibility of enforcing a language that had very few, if any, native speakers, got made fun of a lot. Um, and even those who were really on board with it began to slowly doubt its practicality after a few years. Take this man, Zhao Yunren. We could talk about him all day. He's my favorite person. 
Um, he is a graduate of Cornell and Harvard and was so committed to this hybridized national language that he made a recording of it in 1921. But by 1924, he was quietly telling friends and family that he believed that the national language should be pure Beijing Fangyan, leading him in 1925 to join several other reformers to formally propose that. Later in life, um, he explained that the original hybrid sort of like created language was just never going to succeed because it was impossible to promulgate, right? Reflecting on it, he laughed. For 13 years, I was the sole speaker of this idiolect meant to be the national language of 600 million people. Okay, so in 1925, the language of Beijing is sort of determined by this group that was tasked by the Department of Education um, to be uh, the national language, and then that's picked up by the uh, by the by the woman by the KMT um, in the uh, 19 in 1927 after they 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 take hold of the whole country, right? Um, and um, this dream of of creating something that represents the whole nation fades away. But calling something the language of Beijing, uh, or calling the language of Beijing a national language, when linguistically, right, it's just another re like language that's spoken in China, right, um, doesn't immediately make it a language in the eyes of the public. And simply calling Feng Yim non-national languages doesn't immediately make them subsidi subsidiaries or variants. So in order to create that hierarchy that we see really viscerally today, um, state actors and their collaborators had to convince the general public that their new national language could represent the whole nation. And inversely, the connotations inherent in the word dialect, its presumption of hierarchy and dependency, had to become integral to what a feng, what that term feng yim is. So the transla transformation of the language of Beijing into national language was partly done through public policy. Um, the government decreed that the national language should be taught in schools, encouraged its use in radio, supported magazines like, na not yet, National Language Weekly. And by the 1930s, some of these encouragements became threats. One of the examples that's often given is the example of cinema. Uh, in the 1930s, Chiang Kai-shek's government attempted to censor cinema in other Chinese feng yin besides the national language, targeting in particular the thriving Cantonese movie industry in Guangzhou. Um, they did not have much control over Hong Kong, but there was obvious, also obviously a thriving movie industry there. Um, on the one hand, these policies were not terribly effective at getting people to speak the national language. Most children didn't attend schools in 1930s China, and among those that did, the central government didn't really have the reach to regulate what language teachers used in the classroom. Uh, in the process of researching this book, I, I interviewed a man from Xiamen um, who did learn Beijing's pronunciation in Xiamen, but he made a big deal about the fact that that was extremely rare, um, that, that it did happen, right, and that he did but that it was not common. Um, and he felt it was more common in Shaman and he's like, that's why we're great. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, he was really proud of that. Um, and while the Cantonese movie ban sparked fierce debates among filmmakers and cultural critics, it was difficult to enforce. Um, indeed, many filmmakers moved their production to the British colony of Hong Kong or simply aired the films without sending them in for government approval. But despite the fact that the government could not enforce these policies, their mere existence still reinforced a hierarchy. Whether people spoke it or not, um, the language of Beijing literally had a new name, the language of the nation or national language. Um, and it's a term that we start to see in magazines and textbooks and on radios and in newspapers. In other words, regardless of who spoke it, national language policies normalized a hierarchy, right? Made it seem like that's the norm. And sometimes normalizing a hierarchy was done in ways that weren't even explicit, done in ways where the act of doing, the act of creating the hierarchy was smothered into discourse and hidden behind claims of objectivity or science. The clearest example of this is the discipline of linguistics. Uh, linguistics in China underwent a huge, this is a huge topic, so we can come back to this if you'd like, um, but it went a under a really big transformation in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, it was galvanized in particular by the May 4th movement, a series of protests against Japan's acquisitions there it is, um, of Germany's colonies in China that dovetailed with ongoing calls from educated elites for a complete upheaval of China's core cultural institutions. In the midst of this, academics um, began to eagerly develop new university programs meant to create modern knowledge about the country and its people. And this translated in the early 1920s um, into an advocacy for a more scientific study of language. Um, so a lot of the men who were who were pushing this had received their doctorates in Europe and the United States and claimed that traditional ways of studying Chinese languages were outdated and unscientific. Um, and they simply felt it was sort of objective truth that all human 
human languages were in this sort of like hierarchical model of like a taxonomic tree. Um, to show you what I mean, I'm going to go ahead and let Professor of English Lin Yutang explain it because he's real clear about it. So there should be no confusion as to the definition of the word fang yan or feng yin. Uh, the world's languages are connected in one system called a yu yan xi. Here um, the, in the brackets, those are his translations, not the rest of it is mine, but in the brackets, they are his English translations. Um, so family of languages. Language families are then divided into yen or languages, and within each language there are divisions of feng yin or dialects. We ought to declare that when we speak of feng yin today that we are using it with the meaning from modern linguistics. So what he's saying is that Chinese languages needed to graft onto a model prescribed by scholars of linguistics in Europe and the United States. And that meant that their methodologies needed to presume that, that basically Chinese languages related to one another like this. So this is an old model. This is from the 19th century. This is a German model. But what's important here, right, is that like branches that are longer like here, that is a language. The itty bitty little ones at the end, those are dialects, right? Um, and he believed very strongly, like a lot of men in, in the, at this time, right, that this is the model for understanding Chinese languages. And this is inherently hierarchical. Now, this is not to say that Lin or other dialectologists directly claimed that all Chinese, like, like all of these Chinese feng yim, like Cantonese, derived from Mandarin. They knew that wasn't true, right? But when they go around, on the one hand, exist, insisting that this hierarchical model is objective fact, well, simultaneously, they're also supporting public policy that claims that there's only one national language. It makes it really easy for there to be a slippery slope to just sort of say, well, Cantonese derives from Mandarin, right? Um, again, no, I don't think any linguist would argue that, right? But you can see how that slippage creates that impression. Right? So what's the takeaway here? First, um, the ex expectation in the early 20th century that in order for China to be a nation, it needed to have a national representative language created the broad presumption that there could be only one Chinese language. Second, the creation of a national language that took only one one uh, Chinese language as its standard created the political will to allow one Chinese language to gain a cultural significance that others didn't have. And third, that cultural and political significance was emphasized through a number of venues. Um, now, at this point, you may be asking yourself, why does this even matter, right? Who cares if Cantonese is called a language? I know a lot of you do, right? But for those who don't, right, why does it matter what we call it, right? To me, the words that we use bound observable things to a series of assumptions, ideas, and cultural touchstones. And as such, they frame our thinking and guide our actions. If we presume that Cantonese has all of the connotation of the word dialect, that it is a dialect, and that all other languages like it are dialects, right, is we force China's diverse linguistic landscape into a hierarchy in which all but one are subordinate. Um, and this isn't limited to linguistic structure alone. Ultimately, to speak a language is to grasp and own a particular kind of cultural power, and to speak a dialect is to settle for an expression of identity that is limited in scope and diminished in its significance. In this way, what counts as a language and what is merely a dialect is a battle in a place over a, a battle over a place in a cultural hierarchy. And this has very material effects too. The political power in speaking a language and having an identity validated affects um and having our identity validated affects us in concrete material ways, whether it's through educational resources, um, television programming, um, all of these kinds of things. We just, we throw money at languages in a way that we do not at dialects, just as a global community, right? And we can say that should change. Um, I very strongly believe that should change, right? But in the space that we are now, that's generally how material, mater the materiality of language tends to work, right? Um, and I want to actually bring up a really interesting one. Um, so, um, Gosh, this is a year old at this point, which is sort of crazy. Um, but a year ago, right as Russia was beginning to invade Ukraine, Duolingo posted this about why we call Ukrainian a language rather than a dialect, right? Um, it's a very nuanced answer. Um, for Duolingo, like bravo to Duolingo. As far as I know, they do not have this nuanced of an answer for Cantonese, 
Um, they should, but they don't. Um, or they didn't a year ago. I have to admit, I haven't checked in a while. Um, but what Duolingo is doing here wisely is recognizing that the designation given here is political rather than linguistic. But much more importantly, that a designation matters in terms of political power, that the designation could be used to diminish a country's claim to nationhood and a fact that in a context of a brutal war is very real and material. Um, so that's why I think these distinctions really matter in terms of their global implications. Uh, when speakers of other Chinese languages cannot learn them at leading global institutions or in their own communities, this not only leads to material discrimination, but it puts people who speak these languages at a deep disadvantage. Language isn't just something we speak, right? It's a, there's a materiality to it, and it translates into cultural and political power. Um, I am going to sort of stop there. Um, I, I, I'm looking at the chat and there were so many questions. Um, I'm going to try and blast through there. So there were a, like a few dozen <laughs> submitted ahead of time. I tried to, I picked a few and, but a lot of them had overlap. Um, so I tried to group them. <laughs> if yours didn't get chosen, it wasn't because it wasn't good. There were so many good questions. Please understand. I'm doing my best. Um, so here are ones. Um, so the first one is, um, there were a lot of questions about the role of the Chinese diaspora in the categorization and maintenance of Cantonese. Um, so as far as um, sort of um, categorization goes, um, this is really interesting because I think that there is a lot more room um, in places outside of the PRC for pushback against this. And I do include places like Taiwan and Singapore um, and, and Southeast Asia and, and even Hong Kong at this point. I think that there is space for pushback against this idea. Um, Hong Kong, I know, is a really contentious space right now, um, but I do think that there is, this is one of those things that you can, you can, there's, there's room for this, right? In a way that I feel like there is less room within the PRC. Um, I feel I, I can be a lot more forceful about this um, outside than inside, if that makes sense. And, and I, and I think that's really good, right? Because even if, um, I think that there there is sort of transnational networks of communication, and I think that those things matter. As far as maintenance, I think that's the same. When we're looking outside of sort of Chinese majority speaking countries, right, then maintenance um, really comes down to communities and education, right? And those are spaces where in the diaspora, we have a fair, like there's a fair amount of, of material power, right? Um, and knowing that there's investment in Cantonese language education, I think matters in terms of how it's thought of globally, right? Um, so I, I think that I think the, the sort of the, the short answer to this, right, is that I think that these things matter because I think that um, there's space and materiality for that um, in places like um, England or or the UK or the United States or Canada or Australia. Um, that there's just less space for that in the PRC, right? Um, I, this one, this question I pulled out because I really love it. So I feel, I feel uncomfortable with the CCP's monolist linguistic turn, um, as well as the coverage of this phenomenon in Western media, which I feel tends to emphasize the negative aspects of life in China or the Chinese government. Um, how, um, how can the interpretation industry and language industry in the United States improve their Cantonese language effort to align themselves with the concept of viewing Cantonese as a language rather than dialect? I really love this question because I think that it's it's really important, right? I don't, I really very strongly believe that advocating for Cantonese and being critical of the power structures here doesn't have to be an anti-China project. And one of the reasons I brought up things like the United Nations and my university is because I do not, I think that this, I think, I do think that there is space to be critical of, of the PRC's language policy because I think that they see power for themselves in reinforcing a kind of monolithic Chinese identity. Um, if you are the enforcer of a national identity, you have an enormous amount of power, right? So I don't want to dis dismiss that. But I don't think that that has to come in the way of just criticizing the Chinese government. I think we can criticize our tendency to do this everywhere. Um, and I think that we can also celebrate, right? Um, when um, when the Save Cantonese at Stanford um, the sort of like movement was going on, which was really inspiring. Um, yes, I, I see the wave there, um, Ryan. Um, but one of the things that that uh, Jamie Tam said, um, my my far more brilliant namesake here. Um, one of the things that she said was that we are not anti 
language, right? We're not anti any language. And that has really stuck with me. I don't think that being anti, I, so I, where I think this tends to go wrong is A, where we overemphasize the power of the PRC government. They are not alone in this, right? And that B, when we make it seem sort of anti-Mandarin. Um, I, I, I think this, this sort of came up while I was messing with my tech, but um, I am not a heritage speaker of either Mandarin or Cantonese. And so I don't want to be in a position where I'm, I'm telling people sort of what to feel or how to feel about these things, right? Um, but I, I, I think that there is a lot of space to celebrate multilingualism that I, I think is, is ultimately more effective for all of us, right? Um, and so, um, and and that and and that we give too much agency to the PRC government when we only focus on them, right? Um, so, um, so that's that's sort of my is is be pro all languages. Oh, and this is the other thing is that I was going to say is that I I feel a little bit uncomfortable often or when people sort of say that like, well, Mandarin's not a real language or Mandarin's not Chinese enough like that. I think that to me is the sort of wrong way to go about it because I I, I think what sort of PRC language policy and, and also like Singaporean language policy, Taiwan up until the 1980s, right? There's that when you create winners and losers, kind of everyone loses, right? And so I think that there's ways to celebrate all languages, but also recognize that this is a language spoken by tens of millions of people, right? So that's that's my, I, that's why I pulled out that question. Um, this is, this question three, this was about half the questions I got was some element of this, right? What is the future of Cantonese? Is it dying or others like it dying? Um, and my sort of answer to this question is, um, so, so there's a few ways to answer this question. The first is um, I'm always worried about languages that do not have hegemony um, and Cantonese is one of them, right? That said, power is complicated. Um, and if I were worried about um, any sort of like Han Yu Feng Yin, I would be, I, I think Cantonese has more survivability than most. And that is simply because um, the structures that make language preservation possible, there's just a lot more of them for Cantonese than say like Qingdaohua, right? Um, in terms of like pedagogical materials and educational institutions de like devoted to them, music, movies, like these kinds of things really matter, right? Um, and so there are some, there's, 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 there's in there's always there is still like many many other hierarchies besides Mandarin and everything else, right? Um, that said, um, when you Cantonese also lacks a lot of the structures that make sure that like English and Mandarin and Spanish are not going anywhere, right? Um, like in any foreseeable for a while, right? Um, because they have so much power behind them and Cantonese doesn't have anywhere near that kind of power. And while I think we should decouple nation states and languages, I think that's really important. Um, having a nation state means that your language has a real structure to it. Um, and and we, I think we should be critical of that, right? But that is also the world that we live in. Um, uh, somebody also brought up like other, like, like um yue fang yen right um like um um like 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 from from other areas in guangzhou those are the ones that are sort of mutually like varying degrees of mutually intelligible or are often spoken in rural places where the, there are fewer structures right um and where those sort of preservation efforts matter more right um and um, somebody asked, like, um, um, are there examples of 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 um, language preservation projects? Yes, uh, or like like revitalization projects. Yes, although um, the fact that it is in a white majority country says something. But Welsh is a good example, right? Welsh was kind of really dying out, and then people put a lot of effort into it. Um, and the next slide, I have some books and articles that I think are really good. Um, and one of them is is by James Griffiths, and he compares Cantonese to Welsh. Um, and I learned a lot from him. Um, when was so there was a lot about the history of Cantonese. Um, how old is it? When was it recorded? How is it recorded? So this is where things get really complicated. And I don't have a neat little answer here on this. I don't have a neat big answer on this. I don't have a neat answer at all. <laughs> um, but um, the basic answer we have here, right, is that um, 
Phonology of languages spoken in China have been recorded for a very long time, overwhelmingly through what we call rhyme tables or rhyme books, which is where you have collections of characters that are sort of like this rhymes with this rhymes with, right? Like, and so they're like, they're categorizations of characters. So you can tell if all of the characters, right, that are pronounced like dung are all there. Like we know that they're all pronounced the same, even if we don't exactly know how they're pronounced, right? Um, one of the things that are brought up among a lot of Southern Fangyan, um, Cantonese speakers have a lot of, um, ha tend to have a lot more of a, of a voice in written materials. And so this is very heavily emphasized in Cantonese speaking areas. The other is in Hakka speaking areas. Both really like to emphasize that the rhyme tables fit their contemporary languages better than other languages. Um, but to my understanding, there's a lot of consternation about this, um, trying to, and, and I am not a linguist, so I cannot tell you quantifiably which, which ones fit better, right? Um, this also goes for like Tang Dynasty poetry, except for that in general, Southern Fangyan fit better than Northern ones, right? Um, that's just generally true, right? Um, so, um, so that's how vaguely how it was recorded and, and where this idea of it being from the Tang dynasty or Tang poetry came from. Another place where this comes from, so that's an old, um, that, that, that has been around for a long time, right? This idea that, that, that canonical texts or important historic texts um, sound better in Southern Fangyan. Um, like during the Qing dynasty, uh, there was one emperor who tried to make everybody speak um, a Northern language because he was annoyed he couldn't understand his officials. Not everybody, let me rephrase, people who were officials, right? Um, and people in, in, in Guangzhou and in Jiangsu just threw a fit about it because they were like, no, like we're studying all of these texts and our languages fit it better. So why in the world would you tell us to do that? You crazy person, right? I don't think they, they did not say that. That is, that is no, <laughs> nobody said that about the emperor um, and survived. But in any case, they, they really put up a protest about it. So that's, that, that, um, that contention has been around for a while, right? Um, there's been real pride in Southern Fangyan for a long time, understandably, right? Um, our connections to historic texts matter, right? Okay, and then finally, um, do you see any parallels between the Mandarinization of the PRC um, and the promotion of Guangzhou, Hong Kong Cantonese over other non-Mandarin speaking communities of overseas Chinese or in colonial Hong Kong? This is a fascinating question. And I think it gets to a little bit of what we were talking about in question three or what I was talking about. Um, which is this idea that um, like these material hierarchies are not just Mandarin versus everything else. Um, and I, um, one of the articles that I will switch to in a moment um, is by um, a, a linguistic anthropologist named Gerald Roche um, who wrote about Tibetan actually. And what he writes is that um, Tibetan is sort of in this space of precarity because Tibetan, um, like Tibetans, right? People are being consistently having their identity and um, and autonomy and just sense of self constantly threatened by the PRC state. And the way that they've dealt with that, right, is to really um, collect around this idea of a Tibetan identity that is extremely um, um, concrete. And that the, that the effect of that is that other Tibetan languages that are not standard Tibetan are often like sort of like doubly oppressed, right? Um, that they are oppressed both by the PRC state and by, um, and, and by um, like the Tibetan sort of like representatives of, of the Tibetan nation or the Tibetan people. Right. Um, and I see and there's a similar sort of thing here. And I don't have an easy answer for this. Right. Because in order to teach Cantonese, you have to have something to teach. And, and the minute you start creating structures to teach it is, is the minute where you start to have some semblance of standardization. And that always creates people who are sort of left out. And I think we can be really intentional in our inclusivity. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but th there's an extent to which that's that's a really difficult thing to happen, right? Um, I think the big difference, however, is that there are not, um, Hong Kong is sort of really interesting here, um, but I do not think Hong Kong has the sort of like um, state structures that create hierarchy the way that the PRC does, or Taiwan up until pretty recently. Um, in Hong Kong, instead, um, the effort was to create uh, it was to make Chinese broadly the official language 
um, of Hong Kong, which was meant to be inclusive. So that doesn't get rid of all the hierarchies, right? There are hierarchies everywhere. Um, but it does make it so that it did not sort of like inherently within the policy, right? Um, create that hierarchy, which is which is really fascinating. Um, so, okay, I'm going to stop there because I, I see 54 <laughs> questions, um, which I, 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 I will in no way be able to answer them all. But I don't know, um, Deng Lo-Si, if you want to pick questions or what do you think the best idea would be? Um, here are some, here are some, um, um, some further readings that I have. There's one I left off of here. I feel really bad about it, but it's really good. It's by, I'm going to put it in the chat though. Um, um, and it's by, um, well, shoot, I'm going to also, um, it's called, um, it's by Jeff Wong, um, called um, The Invention of Mandarin, um, which is also a really good article. So um, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you so much, Gina. So I was so focused on listening to you that I wasn't actually monitoring the chat, but I can tell that there are a lot of questions here. So what about in the last 10 minutes, you can go through them and then just pick out the ones that you would like to address. Okay, I will, I will, I will do my very best. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so far I'm seeing Republic of China. So yes, yeah. Um, looking for questions. This is just a really interesting chat. Um, uh, yes. Oh, here we go. Question. Okay. Um, what about the struggle for Cantonese to survive even in Chinatown areas outside the PRC? If you compare New York City's Chinatown 30 years ago um, versus today, the linguistic landscape has completely changed. I think that's really true. Um, and, and I think that's true everywhere, which is why I think that uh, the idea that we should just entirely blame the PRC government is not entirely, it's, it's, it, it misses something there. Right. Um, and so, um, to me, right, this is, this is where I think talking about why we call Cantonese a dialect and what we lose when we call Cantonese a dialect. I also would like to point out that there are a lot of like Cantonese speakers and speakers of place of, of other sort of um, Chinese Feng Yim. So um, Feng Shu's book, Silencing Shanghai, talks a lot about people who are really worried about losing Shanghainese. Um, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful sort of um, anthro, like an ethnography. Uh, she, she does a lot of interviews about people and linguistic choices. And they don't care much about whether it's called a language or a dialect. They just want it to be preserved, right? Um, to me, I, I think that that's that's a that's a sentiment I don't want to ignore, right? Because I, I don't want to not give voice to that. Um, but I, I do think that this is why the, these terms help advocacy quite a lot, right? Um, it's just it's just a lot easier to say that um, um, this is like this. That's why we should teach it and continue to teach it and these kinds of things. Um, and, and to sort of think about like immigrant communities, right? Um, one of the reasons China Hat Town has changed very a lot is because immigrant communities have changed quite a lot, right? And so I think the more inclusive we are, the more likely we can create space for that balance, I think, right? I am just one person. <laughs> um, but I, I do sort of think that um, the, the 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 bigger point here, however, um, and this is also something that I'm, I'm stealing here from Gerald Roche, um, is that is that like languages don't die um, on their own. I, I, one of the things I get told a lot, probably not as much from this audience, but from others, right, is that well, this is going to happen inevitably, right? Like, I mean, it's just financially, it's better to teach your kid Mandarin. It's like going to make you more money, et cetera. And this is something that's commonly said in Hong Kong too. Um, and and I, I mean, there is an extent to which I don't want to dismiss the way that I think some people feel sort of really powerless in looking at language rights. Um, but I also think that we ought to not think of it as in the passive or as inevitable, right? Languages don't die. We, as a big collective, we um, make them die, right? And I again want to stress that power really matters here, right? There are some people that have significantly more power than others to make die or make live, right? Um, but I think if we think about it in terms of agency, then we can think about the small ways, like this alliance is so powerful, right? In thinking about how, what we can do as people who are not like Xi Jinping, 
right? <laughs> or, or not the, the president of Stanford or, or any of these kinds of things, like what we can do, right, is, is um, at some point there has to be, and, and I think the story of how, of like the Welsh revitalization effort is, is really telling here. Um, also, Hakka is another sort of interesting example. Hakka is not easy necessarily to learn, but it is a, it is a language and an identity and a history that in part gets a lot of a lot more attention than it might otherwise because there were some people who really cared about it right um so that's um that's something i would say um okay um trying to um would cantonese and other chinese languages be stronger if we kept using classical chinese instead of i mean so i i'll, I'll sort of um um so the, the question is would cantonese and other chinese languages be stronger if we kept using classical chinese instead of using mandarin as the national language i'm gonna actually break this apart a little bit um because i, I think it's interesting to talk about script right um and so um there, there's sort of three concurrent national like language reform efforts that are happening at the same time. Um, and as Zheng Lushi said, this is, a, this is a contentious political topic. Um, but what's fascinating is that actually of the three language reform efforts in the early 20th century, this was the least contentious. Um, because the other two were script reform, right? So what do we do with, with the, the, the actual script of Chinese, and the other was sort of like written style reform, right? As which is sort of the classical versus what we normally now write in, which is sort of a vernacularized version of Chinese, right? Those were much more contentious. So I brought up Zhang Taiyan here, and he was really mad about the idea of Beijing's chosen as the national language. But you should have seen him taught when he like wrote about people trying to get rid of characters uh because nothing sort of brought out the vitriol of John Tian than the suggestion that Chinese characters be Romanized, right? Um and so I mean I, I think rather than thinking about sort of like Mandarin versus anything else, I think it's that to me where where if we're looking at the root of this hierarchy, it is um it comes from a space whereby we all decided in the early 20th century that hierarchy was good, normative, and modern, right? Um, and, and, and interestingly, this is something where I think we can give some, some agency and perhaps blame uh, to European imperialism because they are getting a lot of these narratives from countries that are invading China and saying, well, you guys aren't modern because you don't have a like standard language. Um, I'm, I'm halfway through... Um, um, R. H. Kuang's book Babel, uh, which is which is a sort of fantasy sci-fi book, but it is entirely about this question of language um, and and translation and in, and power in the context of European imperialism. And one of the things she points out correctly, even though it's a sci-fi book, right, is that this idea of dialect and language and that modern nations have one singular modern language that is an import. Right. It is translated and taken seriously. I don't want to not give agency to Chinese nation builders here. Right. But it is it is something that in some ways is is also like violently imposed as well. So I, I think that it's worth sort of keeping that in mind as well. I don't know if that exactly answers your question. <laughs> I tried. I did my best a little bit on this one. Um, so let's see. I'm looking for questions here because I think we have like three more minutes. Um, Hello, will there be a recording available? Da, da, da. Um, does standard Chinese in Cantonese give Cantonese the buffer? Wait, does using, oh, this is a great question. Um, um, this is um, from Chester Lung. Does using standard Chinese, basically Mandarin, but only in written form in Cantonese, give Cantonese the buffer and prestige to endure longer, or should Cantonese switch to written Cantonese? This is a great question. Um, so I, I'm going to leave a, aside the should for a moment and talk a little bit about the what has happened, right? Um, there are efforts, interestingly, in, um, gosh, starting in like the early, before the end of the end of the Qing, right, um, to, to write in a sort of like localized vernacular. Um, there are like what are called Baihua newspapers. There's a Ningbo one, there's a Guangzhou one. Often these guys were pretty anti-Qing, so they were constantly on the run and their publication was not always um, 
consistent, right? Because it's like, well, this guy had to run underground for a little bit because he was criticizing the Qing. Um, but there's there's a good history of that. There's also a Cantonese literature movement um, from the 1940s. Um, you find Hong Kong authors that often play with this as well. Um, but does does it matter? Yes, I think it does, right? Another thing that matters, um, actually, uh, Raymond Pai over at UBC and I were talking about this at one point um, in, a, in, a, in a panel we did together, that like, um, input methods also matter. Um, I, um, I know that there are Cantonese input methods, right? Um, but they are often less hegemonic than pinyin, right? And so I think especially in the PRC, right? Um, and so those kinds of things really matter too. Um, because at the at the sort of end of the day, um, most Cantonese speakers who are also readers of Chinese can read Mandarin grammar in a way that um, Mandarin speakers cannot read Cantonese grammar, right? Um, should it? Changing something like that takes a lot of time. I think that this is happening organically in places like social media. Um, so I don't think that, I, I, I do think that there is a Cantonese written literature. It's just often in places like manga and Facebook comments, right? Um, so I, I think it's definitely there, um, but it's not in places like newspapers, right? Um, and so um, I, as a historian, there is, I don't have a good model for how you get something to take off, if that makes sense. Um, but um, I don't know, so I don't know what the should is here, um, because you also want people to read and, and engage, right? Um, but I do think it does matter. Um, so. Um, it is it is eight o'clock. Um, I'm I'm trying to see if there are any other questions that I. Um, <laughs> what is the best Canto hip hop song and why is it Ellen? Yeah, um, fair enough. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I don't. I'm looking. I'm looking for. Is there a word in Cantonese that is untranslatable? You wished English or? Oh, that's such a good question, and I feel put on the spot, and I don't know. But I'm going to think about it, and I'm going to send it to Zhang Wuxi <laughs> if that's okay. But that's that is a that is a great great question because um, it's 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 really good. Um, and but yeah, curse words are good. There's really good curse words. Um, that's totally fair. I learned a really good one when I was in Hong Kong and I wish I could remember it and I just cannot and I'm very sorry. But um, anyway, yes, um, I, I, I'm over time now. I'm not sure if there are, if there's anything else I should do. Um, Zhang Lo -si. <laughs> Yes, let me ask Ryan, our moderator. Ryan, do you see anything that you would really like uh, Dr. Tom to address? I think the conversation's been flowing really smoothly, Dr. Tom's. I think I addressed most of the main points, especially given our time constraints. I'm sure we could spend hours here continuing the conversation, but yes, yes. all good things must come to an end. Yes, thank you. So thank you for being such a great audience, everyone. Thank you once again for coming. Yeah, thank no, you. No, my pleasure. Okay, good night. Good night, everyone.